I'm going to leave it like that because you're otherwise not going to Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the fourth, I think, edition of the SEM NSV dev room here at FOSTAM. Uh, we've got a great lineup of talks today. Uh, so without further ado, given the uh, various delays related to AV, uh, I'd like to introduce Ray Kinsler from Intel, who's going to give a, a presentation on um, the path to data plane microservices. Some of the things to do in containers as well. Containers, and I'm going to talk about containers and cloud native briefly. Thank you so much. Um, before I start, uh, who here is from Brussels? Anybody from Brussels? Nobody from, that's amazing. Okay, I was, at, I was at the Brussels hackerspace yesterday, and I had the most fun. I had so much fun, I bought a t-shirt. And it said, it's soldering irons, uh, rescued machine shop tools, uh, open source, and beer. It's a, a great combination. So I was going to give them a shout out because I had such fun there. So I'm here today, and I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about and data plane microservices, and I'll, but I'll get to them in a little while. I want to first talk about some trends. Oh, sorry, this is the rough agenda for what I'm going to talk to. I'm going to briefly talk about network. Um, I'm going to briefly going to talk about network function evolution. No, that's the wrong one. There we go. Network function evolution. And again, I'm going to talk about the containerization of uh, network functions and why network functions are being stripped of virtual machines and why they're being put into a containers instead. I'm going to talk about cloud native network functions, why they're coming, uh, what that means, and then I'm going to obviously summarize at the end. So I took great pains in um, making this slide to kind of, to kind of sum up the, the general trend that I'm seeing. Uh, which is that, you know, network functions were, you know, originally they were, network functions were all built in ASICs, right? And a lot of business, a lot of companies made very good business out of designing routers and switches and, you know, and, and BRASs and firewalls based on ASICs. And then sometimes in the noughties, they became more and more software defined and more and more put on top of general purpose processors. Um, but you could describe that there were, you know, the, the way that the, these boxes were designed was they were using general purpose processors under the hood, but they were running very proprietary software underneath. They were running, you know, sometimes it would be a RTOS, sometimes it would be a custom OS, rarely it was Linux. And the software tended to be mon what I would describe as monolithic. So the software assumed it was the only thing running on the system, kind of like the good old bad old days of DOS when uh, the software in DOS assumed it was the only thing running on the system and just grabbed all the system resources and that was fine. And that's typically what you tend to see with monolithic software. It owns all the cores, it owns all the system memory, and it grabs all of the I.O. And to anybody in this room who develops on top of DPDK, that's probably a very, very familiar to pattern that you're, you're probably a f pattern that you're kind of familiar with, right? It's monolithic. I own all the cores. I own all the I own all the I/O. I own all the memory. So that, what we saw then was we saw a drift from custom operating systems and RTOSs and those kind of things to Linux, and we saw a drift from proprietary software to more open source software, and that's when software defined functions became moved from being, let's say, monolithic on top of discrete appliances to being virtualized. Now they were being deployed in virtual machines. And this is roughly where we are today. From 2012 on, we started to take network functions and wrap them up inside virtual machines and deploy, deploy, them, in, deploy them in OpenStack. And so we're in the age of virtualized network functions. Today, what we're seeing is happening is that virtualization is, well, you know, more and more of network functions are still getting virtualized, but some people are starting to play with moving away from virtualization to containerization. Now, there isn't much change in the software design from here to here to here. The software design is still monolithic. The software design still assumes it owns all the system resources, whether that's all the resources of a virtual machine or all the resources of physical system. The software is still quite monolithic, except in this case, it's getting stripped of the virtual machine and being put in the container. It's still monolithic software. 
But that's where we are today. That's moving on from the age of virtualization to containerization. That's kind of, that we're on that precipice today. In the future, we have to ask the question, and what, what's been happening to date is network functions have been following the same patterns as data center software, because this is exactly what happened to software in the data center over many, many, many years. So we have to ask the question is, if the network functions continue to follow the trend of data center software, will ultimately network functions become decomposed and be for cloud native deployments as microservices? Now, when I was back here, I, and, and by, by the way, I've, I've been working on this stuff for this long. Um, when I was back here, people said, well, these network functions will never get virtualized because they need to have deterministic environments. They need to have, uh, they, they need to have assigned resources. They need these kind of environments that are very, very certain. But yet, network functions were virtualized. And I think we're at a similar point now where people are looking at embracing containerization. But I think it'd be, you know, it'd be too much to say that network functions will never become microservices. And maybe that's what, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But first, let's understand the trend to containers first. Why, con why network functions are becoming containerized? Why we're stripping network functions under VMs and we're putting them into containers? How am I doing for time, Dave? 15 minutes, good man, okay. So, I'll make a long story short. There's a whole bunch of reasons. A whole bunch of reasons in here. Some people talk about a virtualization tax. I don't necessarily agree with them, but the perception is that virtual machines are big, are big and fat, and you unnecessarily use system resources. I don't necessarily subscribe to that view. Um, other, things are, uh, other things people talk about is the software licensing costs associated with virtualization. You've got to pay for the operating systems that run inside the virtual machine. You've got to pay for the operating systems that run on the host. You've got to pay for a hypervisor. And that's, that's certainly good business for somebody. And then also, uh, finally, at the end, uh, you've also people talk about the complexity of OpenStack or the getting things done in OpenStack, the brittleness of OpenStack. People talk about all those kind of things. And it, to be honest, I don't think it's any one trend that's causing people to look at stripping virtual functions of their virtual, uh, of their virtual machines and moving them into containers. I think it's all of the, a little bit of all of these. <clears throat> but a network, if you take a virtual function out of its virtual machine and you put it into a container, its characteristics are still exactly the same. It's still monolithic. It still owns all, it still steals all the cores. It still steals all the IO. It owns a network card. You don't get that network card for anybody else. And then it steals all, it steals all the memory, owns all of the memory. So these are quite greedy. And I didn't really get it for a long time. I didn't really get what the core problem was because I approached it from a, a microprocessor or optimization point of view. I was like, yeah, it's greedy, but that's how you get the performance. It uses all the cores because you don't want anybody else using the cache. You know, uh, you do it uses all the memory because it, it needs certainty. You don't want TLB misses. It uses all the I.O. because it needs that dedicated I.O. And then somebody, t somebody I, 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 I still didn't get it, but then somebody made a really, really good point to me. Uh, he said, Ray, he said the virtual functions that people are deploying today in virtualizations, in terms of management, in terms of your ability to deploy them, in terms of your ability to scale them, in terms of the ability to realize scale out and scale up, look exactly the same as the discrete appliances that we were building 10 years ago. I've swapped truck roll for virtual machines that are almost as hard to manage. Does that make sense? So I've gone, from a, I've gone from a discrete appliance, which every time I wanted to upgrade, I had to do a physical upgrade. It's, only, it's improved the situation by moving them into virtual machines, sure. But if you have a virtual machine that's using all the cores in a single socket, it makes it very hard to do things like live migration. It makes it very hard to do things like high availability, failover. Those kind of things become very hard because the application that's inside hasn't changed dramatically since that application that was being deployed in the discrete appliance. It still is quite hard to manage. <clears throat> 
So that's why people are talking about application decompos decomposition. And this is the 12-factor app. This is the, the, temp this is the template for uh, application decomposition. Those people who practice agile development um, methodologies will be familiar with the agile manifesto, right? This is the 12-factor app. It's the manifesto for designing microservices. And what it really talks about, and it talks about 12 things, and um, some of them are related to software development, some of them are related to DevOps. But the things that I find most interesting are the ones related to application decomposition. So your process, your application executes as an app of one or more stateless processes. It exports uh, services. It has a way, uh, microservices have a way of finding each other. Mic you scale up by running multiple processes and running multiple microservices. And it's disposability. They come up and they tear it down very, very, very quickly. So containerization and cloud native are two separate trends. One is switching the VM for a container. The other one is taking the monolithic application that's deployed in the container and decomposing it into microservices. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what we've done to make containerization of network functions easier. So we've built the, the CPU manager for Kubernetes. So before we did this, in getting a very deterministic execution environment for a container from Kubernetes was quite hard. Now what we have is we have the same kind of things that you expect from virtualization, which is application isolation, sorry, core isolation, core pinning, those kind of things. These are now available through the CPU manager for uh, Kubernetes. We then also built the, um, pretty simple, you want to get huge pages inside your container. Uh, we built the uh, CPU, uh, huge page enhancements for Kubernetes, which was basically a way that you could specify, hey, my container is going to require huge pages because it's going to be running DPDK or VPP or a similar based app network function that requires huge pages. And we also built platform feature, uh, platform node feature discovery, which is basically, if you need a node, if you need a, a Kubernetes to put your container on a node that has things like AESNI, that has things like AVX, AVX v2, any of those kind of um, platform features, or you might need a, a certain security accelerator. So Kubernetes now will understand that a given node will have those kind of accelerations, have those kind of features on board, and will now place your container on the correct kind of node. We also adding platform telemetry. So, and you know, this is something I talk about a lot, and I think Emma Foley, I don't know if Emma's in the room yet, but Emma will be talking more about it as part of the Brahmer project later in the day, which is that a lot more platform characteristics influence whether you're going to have a good experience or going to have bad experience on that platform and exposing those platform telemetry so it's more than just CPU usage it's more than just memory usage it's how's your cache doing how's your memory bandwidth doing how's your PCI Express bandwidth doing and we're exposing those up as well and then finally because we're talking about network functions we get onto IO right the core thing. So we have Multis, which enables you to provision, it's a CNI provider for Kubernetes, enables you to provision multiple virtual, multiple interfaces into your container. So you can have things like control and data plane network separation, you can do things like NIG aggregation. So you're, for the first time, a container can have multiple inter interfaces passed through. There's other options on Multis, there's projects like CNI Genie that do much the same thing. We have a bunch of different I.O. interfaces for containers. You have the traditional one that you're probably used to, which is SRIAB pass-through, passing virtual function into your containers. You then have um, pure virtual interfaces like Vho, uh, Virtio user, which is talk for talking from one VNF deployed in one container, or network function deployed in one container, to a network function deployed in another container, to a virtual switch, or onto the, to the wire. Or then if you need to support socket-based applications deployed in a container, we have a, a new approach which is called the master VM approach. So it turns out that deploy, supporting socket-based applications inside a container is more problematic than you would think because it involves hairpinning traffic through the Linux kernel. So you might think you have a user space-based virtual switch, you have a socket-based application. How does the socket-based traffic get from the user space virtual switch to the socket-based application? That's the hair pin through the kernel, which isn't great for scaling. 
the VPP guys are going to be talking later in the day about a very novel approach that they have to that, um, to that solution. We have another approach, which is for DPDK, which is that you run your containers inside one giant VM, and then you can use Vert.io to support either VNFs running inside the container, inside the VM, or a socket-based application inside the container, and it all, it all happens transparently. Okay. So that brings me on to cloud native. So what I've just covered at a breakneck rate was how to the work that we're doing to strip your virtual is to strip your uh, virtual network function of the VM and put it inside a container. Ten minutes, nearly. Okay. So now, okay. Let me pause for a moment. <laughs> Find my feet. So we just talked about. Um, all of the activities that we have about stripping your network function of the, of, the virtual, of the virtual machine and putting inside the container. But your characteristics of your network function haven't changed at all, haven't changed at all at this point. It still looks very similar to the network function that was being deployed on the discrete appliance 10 or 15 years ago. It still makes all the same assumptions. It still owns, the, all, it still owns all the I.O. that's are given to it. It still owns all the memory. It still owns large chunks of memory, and it still owns all of the core. And one of my colleagues, Bruce Richardson, describes these kind of network functions as being greedy. They own large chunks of system resources, and they don't share very well. So. I st we start looking at why this was happening, and we found that a large, a large part of the reason why this is happening is because this is the way that we designed VPP. This is the way that we designed DPDK. We designed it to make all of those assumptions in order to get good performance. But if you're take, but it turns out to, to deploy those kind of applications, if you're the poor DevOps engineer that actually needs to go and manage a network of, of these actually executing in a cloud environment, it turns out that, as I said earlier, it's a very, very hard thing to do. So maybe that's a square, maybe we're just a round peg and that's a square hole. Maybe we can't solve that problem. Maybe in order to get performance, we need to operate with those assumptions. Or maybe we need to enable the person who's actually doing the deployment to choose. Maybe we need to stop making choices for the people who are consuming our software. And that's, and that's where my, that's the understanding that I'm coming to. We make all of these assumptions, and then we make all of the, these assumptions for the people who are consuming VPP and people who are consuming DPDK. Maybe we need to get out of the way and let them make a choice for themselves. Maybe in certain deployments, they value flexibility over the absolute performance they get out of the system. But today, we're not giving them that choice. Today, they don't have that choice at all. So we need to empower them. So what we need to do is realize models that enable in some circumstances to give the absolute best performance on the system, but in other circumstances enable the most flexible deployments. And then to put the power into the hands of the DevOps engineer who's actually doing the deployment to make the choice whether they want to realize the most flexible or the most performant um, deployment possible. So we need to develop APIs for CPU sharing, for sharing I.O., and for sharing memory. So we need to be greedy when we need to be greedy, and we need to share when we need to share. My son is in kinder, he's just finished kindergarten, and he's just, his little catchphrase they teach him at kindergarten is care, sharing is caring. So we need to care more for the uh, DevOps engineers in the world. But yet, we need to maintain the same API, the same programmatic, same programmatic interface, so the people who are designing the software don't have to manifestly change their applications. So something that we're looking at at the moment is how do you break up a monolithic application, an application that's used to open, owning all of a core? Well, one of the ways is you can build an in-process scheduler. And it turns out, if you look at projects like LibDill, LibMill, they actually realize extremely fast in-process scheduling, just 140 cycles for a context switch inside the process. And by doing that, you can actually move from a monolithic application to a, an application based on an in-process scheduler with a very, very light overhead for actually scheduling microservices running, running inside a DPDK-based execution environment. 
it then, if the ex engineer wants the, the uh, I'll say, the most flexible deployment, the engineer should be able to flick a switch and have those separately executing microservices become separately executing processes. APIs don't change, environment doesn't change, but whether these become separate processes or be these are separate microservices running inside a, the same application space becomes a DevOps choice, becomes a configuration choice for the, the person doing the DevOps engineer. And there are, there are times when you want to be able to share, have multiple small processes that are able to do things like migration, able to do things like scale out, like cloud applications, and able to do things like high availability. And there are other choice, <clears throat> other times when you want the highest performance possible. But yet by maintaining the same scheduler API, it's maintaining the same APIs for sharing CPU time, it then becomes a, a, pro, a, a choice for the deployment engineer. <clears throat> We're doing work in the 1802 release to make the DPDK memory model lighter. So in the short term, uh, I don't know if there's many uh, if people are engineers uh, like me, but what I do today with DPDK is when I run DPDK and I give it like um, the 128, uh, I give it a large amount of memory and if it doesn't crash, I'm generally it's good, right? So we don't really have an awful lot of introspection how much memory DPDK is using. Whereas we're moving, very, we're moving to model in 18.0, I think it's 18.02 or maybe it's 18.05, I think it might be 18.05, where it'll be huge pages on demand. You'll only actually get allocated to huge pages as you use them. So DPDK will become much better about sharing system memory with our processes in the system. And then you can imagine there are certain use cases that don't need huge pages at all, things like virtual use cases, things like containerized microservices, and you'll, we'll need to support 4K pages in the future in, in order to make that happen. And there's a whole bunch of ways to decompose, to have more scalable I.O. for things like microservices. Again, where we are today is the, uh, applicate, the uh, DPDK-based application uses all, gets assigned all of the I.O. We've been doing, uh, the guys, the acknowledge the guys in ver, uh, VPP, the guys have been doing great work in order to make VPP a more scalable platform, a more scalable vSwitch for containerized deployments. So you can really have a very large number of containers talking to a, D, a VPP, DPDK-based virtual switch. But there are also schemes, and I think, I, I think um, there's a speaker later today who will be talking a little bit about this, which is um, MDEV-based schemes, where you can use, uh, maintain your vSwitch, but then use have hardware-accelerated vSwitches, again, for more decomposed I.O. So this is where we are today. DPDK owns all of the I.O where we, in the future, will use a virtual machine to do a better, or where we, sorry, it, where we're moving to, we use a virtual switch to do a better job of sharing I.O. And then very quickly, we're gonna to move to models where we have a hardware accelerated virtual switches. But the important thing here is for the application, for the DPDK based application at least, we want to maintain the same environment. You don't want, as an application engineer, to have to use different APIs in order to support different deployments. So that's why we need to maintain the same scheduling APIs regardless of whether the scheduler is the DPDK scheduler or it's the using the OS scheduler. We want to have the same memory models, the same memory allocation APIs regardless of whether you're using huge pages or you're using 4K pages. And then we also want to have high performance transport, whether that's based on vSwitch or whether that's based on a hardware accelerated v, a hardware accelerated vSwitch. And then you give you empower the my, the DevOps engineer to say, well, actually, I want to use in-process microservices because that's going to be the fastest that's going to be the fastest execution environment. Or I want to use multi-process microservices. It's still fast, certainly not as fast as in-process, but that gives me a nice a, a, ni a, a nice place that between flexibility and performance that makes it much easier to deploy. Or you might look in the future even to have multi-node microservices and that's microservices and running on multi multiple different nodes, communicating across multiple different nodes, which is exactly what happens in cloud native de deployments. So I've kind of gone at that like a train, apologies. Uh, I hope it all made sense. So just to kind of tell you what I told you, um, we're moving from an age of virtual, virtual, uh, virtual, um, virtual network functions deployed in virtual machines. We've done a ton of work to support the containerization of these network functions. You can go to our GitHub and grab our enhancement for Kubernetes. 
and we also have guidelines, application notes, and all source code that are associated with it in our experience kit, which you can grab here. In terms of cloud native network functions, these are things that we're adding to F uh, FDIO, VPP, and DPDK at the, at the moment. One of the first things that's coming out is a new enhanced memory model, which I put down for 1802, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. It should be 1805, and that's coming at you pretty soon. And it, we're going to see more and more of these kind of features to do a better job of CPU sharing, do a better job of memory sharing, doing a better job of I.O. sharing. So I hope all that made sense. Um, I don't know whether I have any time for questions. You have about two minutes. Do I have, um, more importantly, so, do I have any questions? Uh, I may not. One or two questions, Max. Okay. So. Any questions? I can be the de facto fill in. Um, so a question I have regarding cloud native specifically when it comes to containerization. Microsoft is one thing. Cloud native mandates as service mesh mm -hmm. uh, as implementation. And from my perspective as a developer into a containerized environment, I'm going to make different decisions based on whether I'm executing in a service mesh or not. Mm -hmm. how, how do we overcome that challenge to get to that flexibility that, that, that the user can choose? Because if, if I'm cloud native, but I don't get a choice. I'm in a service mesh, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's maybe something that, that I'd, I'd like to get your perspective on. And to be honest with you, I, I think that's a good question. I think um, Jan Meddev is talking today. Um, I don't even... I'm pretending to be You're pretending to be Jan, are you? So Jan's going to talk a little bit more about Legato. I think it's a good point. I'm going to deflect and say I don't have a good answer for the question. <laughs> we could talk about it. We'll maybe talk about it during the Legato presentation. It'll be a good time. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Okay. <laughs> so it was a long question. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, Charles Eckel is coming up next. So a couple of minutes to let people... What, what's the, what's the, defragment the room and, and get out and get in. Uh, Charles will be giving a presentation on Open Daylight as a platform for network programmability. Did you use uh, HDMI or VGA? Uh, I use HDMI. Okay. Oh, hi.